Hi, I'm Jimmy Ibbotson. Welcome to the Fall 88 issue of C-Fans Video Magazine. Hi, I'm Lynn Isaacair. One thing we really enjoy about C-Fans is meeting divers all over the world. And we get some fun cards and letters, too. Jimmy, what do you think's the best comment you've heard from a viewer lately? I think I like that people are starting to call us America's favorite video sport divers. I mean, <laughs> how many are there? I like the lady who wrote in and said that you didn't look like a diver. I'm not sure I like that, but maybe I look like a country singer. I don't know. It did start us thinking, what does a diver look like? You might want to drop us a line with a picture of your favorite candidate. We'll show you the best on an upcoming Sea Fans. Just to let you know that we do listen to what you're saying, this entire issue is going to be a request show. We get things started with an example of our endless search for the perfect dive destination. So often it's a trade-off between tropical, lush, mountainous islands and clear water. Well, we've got one place here that you're going to love because it's an exception to the rule that you can't have mountains and clear water. When we first started going to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, people tried to convince us there was no diving there. It was just a sailing place. Well, we found out they were wrong. And every year we find more divers. Yeah, I think I know how come it took so long for divers to catch on to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It's because the sailors were trying to keep it to themselves. Well, no such luck, yaddies. Divers have discovered St. Vincent. Music accompanies your steps around St. Vincent, where a Caribbean beat pulses behind island life. Divers soon learn what it means to jump up. It's the local lingo for partying. Topside, visitors hike up the mountain or meander through a garden. Underwater, you can study fish or a wall of coral. One thing you won't find above or below the surface, crowds of other tourists. St. Vincent's still a rare find for divers. One reason may be the slight inconvenience of travel from the U.S. since there are no direct flights. Divers take a plane from Miami or New York to Barbados or nearby St. Lucia and then plan a short hop on Liet or Mustique Airways to St. Vincent. Part of a chain of the Windward Islands, these former British territories lie in the southeastern part of the West Indies. They stretch around the eastern end of the Caribbean Sea like stepping stones to South America. The Windward group includes Dominica, St. Lucia, Grenada, and the small cluster called the Grenadines, in addition to St. Vincent. Since 1979, St. Vincent and the Grenadines are now one independent nation. We'll cover the diving around the Grenadines in an upcoming issue, including the little-known island treasure called Beckwith. Famous for sailors, these waters are now attracting more and more divers, and some yachtsmen are taking the plunge below the helm. Atlantic currents meet the Caribbean around the island, meaning slightly cooler water than the Western Caribbean and slower coral growth. But the mix of currents drives St. Vincent's main attraction for divers, throngs of fish. Many dive destinations claim abundant fish life, but St. Vincent makes those boats seem shallow. Here the fish appear in clouds, and if you're a photographer, you may have trouble getting a clear shot. You'll find your lens attacked by fish. Archaeologists believe that the original inhabitants of St. Vincent were a race called Saboni. 
The Arawaks who arrived later called these people the Rock Men because they found the Saboni living in caves and shelters and their petrographs remain. Carib Indians followed the Arawaks. Historians write that Columbus discovered the islands, but of course that must have been news to the people already living there. Europeans settled here in the early 1600s. Later, the island became a British colony after England settled its squabble with France over the land. Today, the inhabitants are an intriguing mixture of many races, including descendants of slaves who sailed on a ship called the Palmyra. It sank in the St. Vincent Beckwe Channel on its way north. Some survivors managed to reach St. Vincent, where the Caribs received them. They soon intermingled, and their children were called the Black Caribs. People on St. Vincent are still welcoming visitors from all nations and speak a mixture of English and French patois. Many divers stay at picture-perfect Young Island. On CFAN's most recent visit to St. Vincent, John Evans and Carol Montgomery sampled the visionary resort. Local owners and managers shape the luxury setting, which includes bungalows nestled in trees along the beach or carved into the hillside. All 30 cottages seem designed for honeymoons with their secluded terraces. An enormous kidney-shaped pool, a private beach, and food that mixes local cuisine and continental standards add to the pleasures. For the active, there's windsurfing and tennis. Young Island lies just 200 yards offshore with its own shuttle ferry running around the clock. The views of St. Vincent and Beckwe mix with gardens for private walks or just watching the water. A local legend tells that a Carib chief once traded the 25-acre Young Island property for a black stallion. Today, we rate the resort as expensive, but worth it. Dive St. Vincent at the Young Island Ferry Dock is owned by Bill Tews, who leads divers to the reef on either of two fast, comfortable outboards. He'll also do night dives, day trips to Beckwe and the falls of Balien, and resort and certification courses. Underwater, he'll be sure to take you to the lush wall. A spectrum of coral bushes marks the drop-off, including white and black stands. Fish swarm around the wall, and many invertebrates hang on its sides. Another convenient underwater site, Bottle Reef, is named for the assortment of antique bottles found among the coral. The reef features more luxuriant gorgonians and invertebrates. Many juvenile fish, including spotted drums, grow at a spot called coral gardens. A well-camouflaged scorpion fish, when disturbed, spreads its colorful pectorals and moves away. Stoplight parrotfish, eels, and crabs complete the garden. Anchor Reef provides a place for more small creatures. Butterfly and drums. Shrimp and crab.
and colorful an enemy gather here. Divers enjoy the tunnel full of black bar soldier fish. Bill, our guide, finds a slipper lobster, complete with its eggs. We don't know if the anchor on this reef was just lost here, or was once part of an old shipwreck. Magic Kingdom affords divers the chance to view the pillar coral near St. Vincent. More invertebrates and other corals thrive here in the crevices and grottos. The Eastern Caribbean has a reputation for limited coral growth because of the meeting of the Caribbean currents with the colder Atlantic. But the waters that surround St. Vincent show the weakness of this general stereotype. On the surface, no tour buses cruise the twisting roads around St. Vincent. But you can hire a taxi for a day, or if you're brave, drive yourself. But remember, keep to the left. Kingstown, the capital, boasts a busy harbor. Visitors shop for local boutiques amidst the original colonial architecture and impressive churches. St. George's Cathedral rises to a tower that's a charming example of late Georgian architecture. A few minutes from Kingstown, a visit to the British stronghold of Fort Charlotte affords sweeping views down the Grenadines. Built in 1806, the fort still stands 636 feet above the sea. Although Charlotte never saw military action, the fort was well prepared for battle with 34 cannons. Head next to a tour of the 20 acres boasting the oldest botanical gardens in the Western Hemisphere, established in 1765. Captain Bly, bounty fame, brought breadfruit to the island and the garden still grows a sucker from the original plant. The rare St. Vincent parrot is protected here as a national bird. The garden also harbors a sofrere tree, no longer found in the wild and originally grown only on St. Vincent. Many areas around the island provide spectacular views of the Grenadines, the 32 islands and keys south of St. Vincent. One of the finest areas for yachting in the Caribbean, Bequi and Mustique are especially fine if you have time for a side trip. The mountainous interior of St. Vincent rises over 4,000 feet in the north to Mount Sofrir a still active volcano that last erupted in 1979. Most of the dive sites cluster around the south and southeast coasts. The sites are from 5 to 25 minute boat rides from Young Island. Also located on the main island of St. Vincent is the other dive operator, Mariner's Aquatic Sports at the Caribbean Sailing Yachts Hotel and Marina. CSY has 19 units with a restaurant and bar. Divers can also rent accommodations in a number of more modest small hotels and guest apartments through Dive St. Vincent. Nightlife on the island is generally limited to the unique homemade music provided by local bands, but the Grand Hotel and Casino host gambling. And all the hotels feature nighttime barbecues. Young Island provides its own cocktail parties with local bands on Fort Duvernay. Adjoining Young Island, the fort was built about 1800 on a massive rock 190 feet above the sea to defend Kaliakwa Bay, then an important anchorage. More history lies below the waterline on the Semistrand, one of a few wreck dives around the island. Driven ashore during a hurricane several years ago and then sunk, the ship rests in 90 feet of water outside Kingstown Harbor. Flocks of fish now make it home, but the hull is still mostly intact. Bill Twos enjoys leading tours of this traditional island freighter. It's easy and safe for a swim through or just gazing at the still tall mast. Trade winds cool the island year round, keeping temperatures between 77 and 81 degrees. Underwater, you'll be comfortable in a skin suit or light wetsuit. Most dives are fairly deep here, 55 to 90 feet, 
so the sights are better for scuba than snorkeling. Although the visibility is still not as pristine as diving around a desert island like Cayman or Cozumel, it's much better than most tropical mountainous islands, usually 60 to 100 feet, depending on the plankton bloom. We find a heavy plankton bloom on our trip this summer. While this limits the water clarity, the plankton provides food for the rich life in these waters. And one of the pleasures of diving around St. Vincent with its hosts of marine life is the chance to observe some interesting fish behavior. Our cameras catch a pair of courting wrasses engaged in synchronized swimming. Wrasses are generally sequential hermaphrodites, meaning that the fish may conveniently change sex if the need arises in the group. Even marine biologists are sometimes puzzled by fish behavior or disagree about its interpretation. The amateur naturalists of the Seafans crew are sometimes equally perplexed. We think the sergeant majors, always territorial, are guarding their eggs until they hatch. They keep trying to chase away a flock of juvenile and adult bluehead wrasses, but in this situation the sergeant majors are clearly outnumbered. The carnivorous wrasses appear to be feeding on the eggs. You can spot the juveniles by their yellow bodies, which change to blue markings as they mature. Whether you're watching fishes, strolling through tropical gardens, or simply enjoying the breeze and a nap in a hammock, St. Vincent will delight and amuse you. You might want to plan your trip there before the crowds of less adventurous travelers discover St. Vincent. Last issue, we showed you the fun of a group trip to Roatan. We've had many requests to look at the south side of this romantic island, so this issue, we've included a short look at the diving from Coco View. That's a resort that has wrecks and a 100-foot wall dive right off the beach. Roatan regulars debate the merits of choosing the south versus the north coast of the island. But fairness dictates the truth. Both sides have excellent diving. Dive guidebooks call Roatan aquarium diving because of the variety of coral growth and reef fish. Fifty of the known 62 coral species in the Caribbean have been identified in the Bay Islands. Both coasts exhibit the familiar Roatan spur and groove formation and walls with dramatic crevices. Yet the northern coast features more consistent fringing barrier reefs separated by bays and channels, while the south barrier reefs lie mostly near the harbors. Perhaps the prime advantage to the south side is the opportunity for beach diving enthusiasts to dive around the clock on the 110-foot wall off the shores of Coco View Resort. The water's just a few steps from your room, so carrying dive gear's a cinch. Beginners, photographers, and hardcore bottom timers all enjoy the opportunity to dive on their own schedule and pace. Uh, that's how we find out because of the unguided diving opportunities here, Doc Radowski, the really expert nice dive director on the resort, lectures extensively on the island, the diving, efficient. safety, and reef uh, conservation before anyone gets wet. So you'll see people that are overweighted and they'll simply be mushing through the water. Most people are aware of, pretty much aware of what their heads, hands, and shoulders are doing almost completely unaware of the damage they're doing with their fins and, and lower limbs. Then a checkout dive is also mandatory. Coco View's famous diving dog, Zinger, also inspects divers to make sure they have all their gear. But once visitors leave the beach and snorkel out to the wall, the pleasure begins. Doc's conservation program has paid off. The wall flowers with a jungle of corals and life. An added bonus is the wreck of the Prince Albert, also just a short swim from the beach. Sponges and fish claim the well-preserved wreck. A marbled blue parrot, groupers, and large snappers follow us around the 140-foot island freighter.
The rainy months in the Bay Islands last from October through March. We hit an especially rainy period, so visibility appears below normal and the storms kick up the silt. In good weather, visibility can reach 100 feet. Coco View specializes in providing reasonable, all-inclusive packages, making the resort an attractive alternative for bargain hunting divers. The accommodations are comfortable but modest, with the action centering around the tropical bar and restaurant. Here meals are served buffet family style. The resort recently completed new bungalows overlooking the water for divers who prefer more luxurious accommodations. Two other resorts serve divers on the south side, Reef House and the recently opened Romeo's. Around the island, surface temperatures hover at a pleasant 80 degrees year-round and there's usually a breeze. When the winds die down, however, the sand fleas come up all over Roatan, so bring your insect repellent. Casual attire is appropriate, but the most popular evening wear may be a BC and a skin suit. That's because another advantage of staying right on the beach is the unlimited night diving, which is excellent with a nearby wall. Lots of critters make their appearance in the gloom, and the wall rises so that you can dive shallow to study the life at your leisure. If you miss cruising on a dive boat, the resort has two. They'll take you to the treasures of the south coast, including Mary's Place and Valley of the Kings. These two dramatic wall dives supply deep crevices hung with soft corals and the azure tube sponges so typical of Roatan diving. Divers need to be careful in the canyons to avoid breaking the splendid black and white coral trees. Off the wall, turtles and other large creatures frequent the open ocean highway. If you caught our other sea fan stories on the north side and Roatan's sister bay island, Guanaja, you'll recall that the Bay Islands lie just off the coast of Honduras. Whatever your political persuasion, you won't have to worry about either the Contras or the Sandinistas here. The rest of Central America has shown little interest in the peaceful Bay Islands. Coco views for bargain hunters and photographers who can never get enough bottom time. Yet the resort's also a jewel for divers who welcome the freedom of a hundred foot wall within a few flips of the fin from the front porch. Everywhere we go these days, it seems we see more and more divers jumping into the water, not with just still cameras, but with their own video gear. So people ask us, when are you going to have an underwater video clinic? This issue, we started two-part series on technique and equipment necessary to make video. Scott Ogle is our own in-house unsung photography expert. Scott comes to see fans with over 15 years experience in television and is an Emmy Award winning cameraman. One of Scott's regular beats used to be the Coors Bicycle Classic. Heck, we convinced him to join up with sea fans by arguing that it can't be any more difficult than shooting bicycles off the back of a motorcycle. Starting this issue, Scott guides beginning video files through the maze of equipment and technique. Ever seen one of these? It's a housing for a video camcorder, the latest dive accessory. Home videos are rapidly replacing the traditional slideshow as a means of remembering your vacation and sharing the experience with friends. Compact camcorders like this one and underwater video housings are opening up the new vista of underwater video to the recreational diver. Hi, I'm Scott Ogle, CFAN's video magazine's director of photography, here to help you choose the underwater video system that's right for you. Lux ratings, CCDs, white balance, flying erase heads. It sounds like some new kind of foreign language. Actually, though, this techno speak is just the language of video. Choosing a video camera can be a confusing task. There's always something new in the marketplace, and next year they promise even more. But right now, cameras offer good pictures in a compact package, and they have enough features to satisfy even the most demanding gadget freak. Besides, underwater, you're not going to use half the options. So why not dive in now, get a video camera, so you'll have moving pictures of your next dive adventure. Your local electronics store is the place to start. They'll have cameras in several different formats, including the familiar full-sized VHS and Beta. Cameras that use these tapes tend to be too large and inconvenient for underwater use, although they do offer a longer recording time. VHS-C is a 20-minute sized VHS tape that can be played back on your home VHS VCR with this adapter. The tape's compact size enables the camera to be very small and easy to fit into an underwater housing. 8mm is another compact tape format. 
These cameras offer flying erase heads for glitch-free cuts between scenes. Without a flying erase head, you'll either have to live with breakup between scenes or edit your underwater tape before playing it for your friends. Since you probably don't have an 8mm VCR at home, the cameras are designed to act as playback decks also. This helps if you want to edit selected shots onto another deck. The newest format is Super VHS, a higher resolution, higher cost version of the old standard. Check out Super VHS if you want the best picture quality and can afford to pay for it. No matter which tape format you select, compare several cameras' Lux ratings. You don't need to know the technical definition of what Lux means, but basically, the lower the Lux rating, the less light you need to make good pictures. If you have visions of being another Steven Spielberg, you can choose cameras that will burn titles right into the picture, or automatically fade from one shot to the next. Topside, these features can add a lot to your home videos. Underwater, I think they just get in your way. But there are some features that really help. Your camera must have the ability to override any built-in automatic focus and exposure controls. The automatic focus won't work through your housing's dome port, and some automatic exposure controls have a distressing tendency to guess wrong underwater and consistently over or underexpose. An electronic CRT viewfinder, which is actually a small black and white TV, shows you exactly what your shot looks like. I think this is worth the additional cost over a bullseye style viewfinder if it's big enough and positioned properly to see underwater with your mask on. So now that you've chosen the right combination of features, format, and price, you're ready to go out and buy a video camera, right? Wrong. Keep your money in your wallet until you've checked with the housing manufacturers. Some make models that will only fit a very few specific cameras. Others will customize the housing for virtually any camera you select. Basically, all an underwater housing is, is a watertight box. It will have either a flat piece of glass or a curved one called a dome port in front of the lens. Dome ports give increased color saturation and a wider field of view. It's also easier to focus with a dome port. Flat ports are better for macro photography, and you can shoot on the surface with the camera still inside the housing if you want to protect it from the weather. With either setup, you'll probably want to add a wide-angle adapter to your lens. Minor scratches in the lens port will fill with water and may not be noticeable, but sooner or later you'll gouge the port badly enough that you'll want a new one. Make sure it can be changed easily and that replacements are available. You can delay the time until you'll need a new port if your housing is well protected with a lens hood when you're not using it. A leak detector may protect you from disaster. The sound you get underwater through a camera's built-in microphone will have a lot of camera noise mixed in with the sound of your bubbles. Some housings have external watertight mics to eliminate this problem. So once the camera's inside the housing, how do you operate it? Some housings connect electrically to your camera, but most use watertight control rods called glands to physically poke and prod your camera's switches. Their ease of operation is an important consideration. Frequently used ones like the trigger switch need to be close to the hand grips for fast, natural operation. This V9 housing by Amphibico uses electrical connections. It's very easy to put together. That's important because you'll be changing tapes and batteries on small boats between dives. Let's take it and a few others down below and see how they perform underwater. Some housings are slightly negatively buoyant, others slightly positive. If you dive walls a lot, you may want a housing that floats. On the other hand, a negatively buoyant housing can be set on the bottom. Whichever you select, it should be close to neutral buoyancy and stable when you take your hands away. A properly weighted housing, like this new one from Sony, sits perfectly level so you can let go of it, then swim around to get into the shot yourself. The Sony housing features a watertight microphone, but depends on a gun sight finder, which is not exactly a precise method of seeing what you're getting on tape. At CFANS, we order our housings to be slightly positive, then fine-tune the buoyancy with bags of lead shot. Our professional Betacam housing, nicknamed Mamu the Killer Whale, weighs 120 pounds fully loaded and ready to go on the surface. Yet it's so finely balanced it can be controlled with one hand underwater. We travel with a whole crew to move Mamu around, but you might want to consider dry weight and size when choosing your housing. It's best if the unit fits under an airline seat so you don't have to trust your video investment to airline baggage. I recommend traveling with a camera inside the housing. It saves a bag and keeps your camera safe. Housings can be made of metal, plexiglass, plastic, or a combination of materials. 
Eicolite uses aluminum for ballast, combined with clear plexiglass so you can see what you're doing. This is handy when you're fumbling around with the gland controls and can't figure out why a function doesn't work. Eicolite's one of the oldest housing manufacturers and makes models for a wide range of cameras. They also have a full line of accessories like this bracket to mount your Nikonis above your video camera. Eicolite says these wings will provide extra stability. I think they're for playing Top Gun underwater. Maybe they help in surgy conditions, but they limit your ability to aim the camera any direction but straight ahead when you're swimming. Tube housings from manufacturers like AquaVideo, Hypertech, and Rec Diving are simple and functional. Tubes are easy to adapt to a wide range of cameras. Control rods and watertight glands provide a reliable method of operating the camera inside if the camera is locked into position so the control rod actually pushes the button it's supposed to. It's easy to check rubber seal integrity on these units. AquaVideo uses lead hand grips for buoyancy control. The wreck diving housing uses standard dive weights for ballast, making its traveling weight less. Amphibico's housing for the popular 8mm V9 camera is a streamlined aluminum design. Its nearly skin-tight shape offers minimum drag. Amphibico uses electrical switches to control key functions, and the camera doesn't have to be removed entirely from the housing to change tape. Just snap the back half off. This convenience has a price. It's nearly twice the price of a tube housing. The ultimate in lightweight and convenience has to be the Iwa bag. Although it's nothing more than a glorified Ziploc made of heavy gauge vinyl, the manufacturer guarantees it to resist water pressure to a 30-foot depth. Remember though, a collapsible bag will compress under pressure, making it difficult to operate the controls. The Iwa bag seems better suited to protecting cameras from spray during the boat trip to the dive site than for use during an actual dive. Whether your underwater housing is aluminum or steel, plastic or plexiglass, depends on this little rubber ring for watertight integrity. It'll take a little silicone grease every now and again to keep it supple. Remember, this ring is all that stands between the ocean and your expensive video investment, so take good care of it. It's a snap. Next time, we'll be teaching you how to use your new underwater video equipment to take great home video movies. Till then, I'm Scott Ogle for CFANS. Australia. People are always asking us when we're going to cover Australia. Soon, we promise. I've always wanted to dive the Great Barrier Reef, but it just seems so far. And it would take so much time away from my concert tour. Jimmy, you don't have to go that far. The world's second largest barrier reef is practically in our backyard. It's Belize with Lighthouse and Glover's Reef. Carol Montgomery just returned from diving Lighthouse with a liveaboard dive boat. She's convinced it's the way to go down there. On the Caribbean coast of Central America, just over an hour's plane ride from the mainland U.S., is a country which boasts spectacular diving, from shallow reefs to deep water walls, and even the famed Blue Hole. To divers, this is Belize. Taka serves Belize City by direct daily jet service from its gateways in Miami, New Orleans, and Houston. Because of Belize's increasing popularity, several other carriers have inaugurated service as well. Plans have been drawn up for a new airport to handle the increased traffic. But for now, travelers must cope with the dilapidated, hot, and crowded Philip Goldson International Airport. Before it achieved independence in 1981, Belize was an English colony. British Honduras. 
Today, Belize City reflects the diverse and colorful history of its English, Spanish, and Mayan residents, and we see all three in the local marketplace. We've been told to watch the time. Belize City is divided by a waterway. Each day at 5 p.m., more or less Caribbean time, prisoners hand crank open the only bridge to let boat traffic through. And if you find yourself on the wrong side, you just may have to stay there a while. Our tour is a quick one because we came to Belize to go diving. Our guide is Captain John Trome of the Isla Mia. He's been diving the reefs and atolls of Belize for the past 13 years. He's taking us to his favorite area, the Deepwater Atoll Lighthouse Reef. En route, we'll stop at the Turnef Islands. Belize is nestled between Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula to the north and Guatemala to the south and west. Just off the coast is the Barrier Reef, Stretching some 185 miles, it's the second largest in the world, and rivaled only by the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Further east are three large deepwater atolls, the Turnef Islands, Glover's Reef, and Lighthouse Reef. Lighthouse Reef is exceptional for its remoteness, which has allowed it to be un unmolested. Uh, there's limited fishing out here. It's too far for most fishermen to come. It's very difficult for hotels and dive operations to work out here. Basically, liveaboards are the only vessels that can come out here on any regular basis, at least successfully. The reef itself offers a lot of variety. Uh, shallow walls, which is something that many sport divers are very much looking for to get their bottom time. There's the inner lagoons, which actually offers a lot of variety from patch reefs to turtle grasses. Uh, we have our walls are not only coral walls, but we have areas where you have big sand chutes running to big coral mounds, offering something perhaps like the coral bombies that are in the Pacific. This atoll was formed by an ancient volcano protruding above the ocean's surface. Over the millennia, coral grew around the volcano in shallow water forming a fringing reef. In time, the volcano sank into the ocean, while simultaneously the coral grew outward around the volcano. When the volcano submerged entirely, all that remained was an encircling ring of coral, which we see today and call an atoll. Charles Darwin formulated this accepted theory of reef formation during his scientific voyage on the HMS Beagle 150 years ago from 1831 to 1836. Here, the coral reef is an anchor around which beauty and life gathers. But this delicate system has many requirements for its continuing growth and survival, including a constant supply of nutrient-rich salt water, which doesn't drop below 72 degrees. Reef-building corals will also not grow below 180 feet due to the lack of light. It is within these narrow confines that this remarkable creature flourishes, providing a home for a multitude of other marine life. In most parts of the Caribbean, live-aboard dive boats are just a convenient alternative to hotels and shore-based dive operations. But Lighthouse Reef is 60 miles offshore, 
So the only way to get a lot of diving in here is by a liveaboard. And once you get outside the barrier reef, you're dealing with open sea conditions, which are often very reasonable, yet sometimes and very quickly can become very rough. This precludes day trips back and forth. Even in a sizable vessel, it's uncomfortable for the passenger. There has been a difficulty in placing hotels out on these atolls because there's no available water. All water is by catchment system. This is what we consider the saving grace for the reefs in order to minimize pressures. It requires liveaboard vessels. Two liveaboards that regularly dive Lighthouse Reef are La Strega and the Belize Aggressor. They're anchored nearby, so we decide to go visiting. The Belize Aggressor continues the standard of comfort established by the original Cayman Aggressor. It's a fast, 100-foot-long, aluminum-hulled former oil crew boat. The dive operation is a model of convenience, with individual dive lockers, the air fill operation, and camera table all centrally located on the aft deck. The swim step is equipped with hot freshwater showers for after dive rinsing. While her 16 guests enjoy the large sun deck, the crew processes slides taken during the last dive. We arrive just in time for dinner, and tonight it's barbecued ribs. La Strega is an 86-foot-long steel-hulled dive yacht. The term yacht means an extra measure of stability and seaworthiness. Built in 1953, La Strega retains her luxurious fittings. Five double staterooms and one quad enable her to accommodate up to 14 guests in air-conditioned comfort. Divers who prefer a smaller boat will be able to choose the Coral Bay when the 62-foot fiberglass liveaboard inaugurates Belize service later this fall. It's designed for smaller groups of six to eight people who appreciate luxury features like the teak interior and huge swim platform. One stateroom even has a bathtub. Tanks are stored and filled right on the swim step, so messy gear doesn't clutter the boat. Although our boat, the 75-foot Isla Mia, was the pioneer lighthouse reef live aboard, she has been pulled from regular service in Belize and is currently introducing her style of unlimited live aboard diving and ultra-casual ambiance to Honduras's Bay Islands. Hey, Nick, what you making? I'm making a chocolate cake for tonight. Mm, that looks good. Oh, What's yeah. for lunch? We got tuna sandwich. Good. Can I have a cookie? Sure, why not? Thank you. So, Ned, what type of diving have you had this week? It's been wonderful. I've had plenty of diving. I've been averaging about, oh, anywhere from eight to ten dives a day. Um, it's been spectacular. The water's been great, nice and warm. Been down to about 130, 140 feet on some of the dives. Had just about all the kind of diving that I can take in a week. <laughs> But what's this? Is Ned in trouble? No, it's just a rescue class taught by Jeff Simpson, a dive instructor from Plano, Texas. I'm starting my toe. I'm not going to mess with equipment right now. I want to get close to the boat where I got some support. All right. While Jeff is serious about his teaching, he keeps us laughing the rest of the time. Well, we saw you doing that rescue class earlier. How do you evaluate victims? Underwater? Yes. Well, I generally try to determine the street value of their equipment <laughs> before I make any moves. Uh, it helps if they're unconscious. You can get them out of their gear a lot easier. <laughs> then you just put a rock on their head, leave them on the bottom. You can put a boy up, you can come back and get them later. I don't think that's the whole idea of rescue diving. Well, that's my idea of rescue diving. <laughs> I figured. <laughs> on this chart, it's an M diver. Go across here to uh, two hours and 14 minutes, and we've been out uh, 219 minus 8 is 211, so three more minutes, we'll be bee divers. All week, underwater visibility has been rather poor, approximately 40 to 60 feet caused by a plankton bloom. The three boats leapfrog to various sites, but the bloom is widespread and no one escapes the greenish water. While a definite hindrance to photography, the plankton enriches the water as it nourishes the plentiful marine life here. It's lunchtime at the Division Reef Diner. This angelfish is ordered today's special, sponge. But these yellowtail snappers turn down a crab appetizer. I'm 
weren't surprised to spot a delicate staghorn coral here. I'd heard they'd all been destroyed when Hurricane Hattie hit Belize in 1961. Hurricanes damage coral in several ways, including uprooting, fragmentation, and some are even killed as larger corals roll over them in turbulent waters. But I learned that Hurricane Hattie bypassed Lighthouse Reef before storming over the Turnef Islands. Belize's barrier reef was the hardest hit, with entire colonies of fragile staghorn and elkhorn corals being wiped out. Finally, we find clear water. It's on the eastern side of the atoll, near Half Moon Key. Here, we see garden eels emerging from the sandy bottom. Our only opportunity to go ashore all week is to visit Half Moon Key, a natural monument protecting a large population of red-footed booby birds. The only human inhabitants of this island are the lighthouse keeper and his family, who lead a simple life in this remote corner of paradise. For over a hundred years, this lighthouse has stood as a beacon of safety, but this rusting ship stands as a warning to passing vessels of the reef's dangers. We slowly traverse these treacherous shallows to reach our final dive the Blue Hole. Jacques Cousteau popularized this geological oddity, an underwater cave which once stood above the ocean, as evidenced by the immense stalactite columns. Many accuse Cousteau of blowing up the delicate coral rim to get his ship Calypso into the hole. John Trome feels differently. Sometimes there's controversy over the methods that scientists use. For example, when the Cousteau came, team came in and did their explorations in the Blue Hole, I wasn't here. Uh, there are people who say that they did dynamiting and other damage to the reef in order to get their vessel in. Uh, I have seen seismograph scars in the southern part of the country uh, by oil exploration vessels, and I can't say I see any evidence of that in the hole. Were they to have done anything, they evidently were careful in what they did to minimize the impact. The Blue Hole Dive is a deep one, down to 130 feet. We have to listen to our captain, who calls for an extra margin of safety. Once everybody's gathered and it's comfortable, I will begin signaling something like this. Tony, come on. And I am going to set the pace with which we will move through the hole. I will make a judgment based on the time and how long we have left as to how fast our maximum rate that we should swim. We snorkel to the hole's edge to conserve air. I'm actually cold descending through the thermocline. Finally reaching the underhanging ledge, we see the massive columns we've heard so much about. The Blue Hole, a spectacular ending to a spectacular week. For divers, this is Belize. The Liveaboard Experience, the hottest thing in dive travel. The Liveaboard Experience means diving mobility and diving comfort. The Liveaboard Experience means diving convenience and diving companionship. The Liveaboard Experience means diving variety. The world's best dive sites with your own floating dive resort. The Liveaboard Experience means getting the most out of your diving dollars and your diving time. To get the best Liveaboard Experience, go with the company that has the most experience with Liveaboards. CNC Travel Service, with over 20 years bringing divers the very best of the Liveaboard Experience. Call 1 800 DIV XPRT and let CNC create an experience for you. Scott Cordelieu is our newest CFANS reporter. 
In his so-called real life, he reports the news of the world on Denver's KMJI radio. But his secret passion has always been diving. And he's been collecting news and diving tidbits to keep you up to date. One of the most devastating hurricanes of the century struck popular dive resorts in the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico in late summer. Some of those resorts will be closed through the end of the year. Cancun and Cozumel were hard hit by Hurricane Gilbert. CFAN's crew member Doug Stevener was vacationing in Cozumel and captured this footage using home video equipment. Popular hotels and night spots were heavily damaged and remained closed, though Stevener reports the visibility at such sites as the plane wreck was returning the day after the storm. The problems are onshore. Docks, hotels, restaurants, almost everything above the surface damaged. Food supplies and clean water were running short. Similar problems reported in Jamaica, which bore the brunt of the storm. But from the Cayman Islands, the news is better. Only three resorts, the Tortuga, the Retreat, and the Driftwood, are still closed. Others have already opened or will shortly. No reef damage in the Caymans, and dive operators are already back in business. Those with travel plans in the Caribbean or Gulf of Mexico this fall and winter may want to double check with their travel agent or group leader. As one of the fastest growing sports in the United States, it was only a matter of time before sport diving became a force in the fundraising community. 1988 appears to have been the year with Patty Dive Shops and divers across the country joining forces to raise $300,000 for Jerry's Kids, the fight against muscular dystrophy. And I know I can speak on behalf of divers everywhere in saying that the sense of reward and satisfaction that we all received in working with MDA was really more than we could have ever imagined. Throughout 1988, scuba divers from all over the country sponsored and participated in underwater activities to benefit your kids. Whether it was an underwater monopoly tournament, a Discover Scuba, an underwater sports challenge, or an excursion to an MDA summer camp to spend time with these special children. Each activity carried the same message. We're divers, and we care about Jerry's kids. Join us. As for the thousands of divers whose time and energy made all these events successful, they discovered that sharing on behalf of MDA took them to the greatest depths they could ever reach, the depths of their hearts. Patty has high hopes for next year's fundraiser and is already getting inquiries from additional dive shops. Florida treasure diver Roy Volker thinks he's headed in the right direction to find the mother load from the Regla, a Spanish galleon that went down with seven other vessels in 1715. Volker recently uncovered 900 silver coins thought to be from the Regla. The ship was carrying 200 million in bullion, coins, and jewels when it sank near Sebastian, Florida. Famous treasure hunter Mel Fisher owns a percentage of the Regla site. He's already made headlines and his own fortune with treasure from another ship in that same fleet, the Atocha. On the other side of the world, Pacific Sea Resources with their salvage ship, the Tengar, in July completed initial operations on the Spanish galleon Nuestra Señora de la Concepción. Part of the Manila to Acapulco treasure fleet, the Concepción sank off the coast of Saipan during the typhoon of 1638. The recovery of artifacts was carried out in cooperation with the government of the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas. The list of artificial reefs off the Florida coast is growing. Two more ships went to the bottom this summer as new homes for marine life and new wrecks for sport divers to tour. The 120-foot Danish freighter Nula Express becomes the first artificial reef for Palm Beach and Broward counties, while the USS Rankin, a former attack cargo ship, becomes the largest artificial reef off the eastern seaboard. The Rankin, at 460 feet, lies in just over 100 feet of water, eight and a half miles off Martin County, north of West Palm Beach. Another Florida reef project is still in the fundraising stages. Backers are trying to gather $130,000 to buy and sink the USS Mulliphon, another 460-foot attack cargo ship. St. Lucie County, Florida sportsmen are hoping that vessel as an artificial reef will improve sport fishing in the area. Traveling around the world brings encounters with all kinds of diving, not all of it good. It happens to our sea fans, a staff, and one of their jobs is to make it safer for you. Hi, 
I'm scuba instructor Doug Stabner, bringing you a Seafan safe diving tip. Have you ever been drift diving or just diving from a boat? And when you and your buddy came to the surface, you found you were much further away from the boat than you wanted to be? Well, this does happen, and it can be a potentially dangerous situation, especially when the sun's low in the sky. You see, when the sun reaches a certain distance on the horizon, reflection can make it very difficult to see objects in the water. You could be missed, and that may mean a long swim on the surface. That's why I always carry this in my BC pocket. It's an ordinary household garbage bag kept rolled up with a rubber band. When I'm on the surface, I can quickly unroll it and inflate it, either orally or with my scuba unit. Holding this above my head or just at water level, I'm much easier to see from the boat. I hope you too will practice this easy and inexpensive way of making sure you're visible off the surface. Until next time, safe diving everybody. Your suggestions for future dive safety tips are welcome. Accidents can happen in diving, but some health insurance companies don't cover dive-related injuries, especially when they occur overseas. Now, divers can insure themselves through DAN, the Diver Alert Network. DAN is offering members up to $25,000 worth of coverage for air ambulance service and hyperbaric treatment. DAN members have already been sent applications. Those who missed out can contact Dan at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. Some of the footage in this edition of CFANS was shot by viewers or staffers using home video equipment. And now that our chief photographer, Scott Ogle, has shown you some tricks of the trade, here's your chance to help. If you have footage of a newsworthy event above or below the water, send it to us and maybe we'll share it with your fellow divers. Send it in care of Eyes Below at CFANS, 7800 East Islip, Suite E, Denver, Colorado, 80231. Until next time, I'm Scott Cordelieu for CFANS. Lots of you have invited us to visit the great inland ocean that straddles the northern border of the United States. But until this issue, the CFANS crew has never dipped a fin into the Great Lakes. Now John Evans takes us on a Michigan tour to bring us some adventure wreck diving. Well, Jimmy and Lynn, I'm starting out in paradise. I've been here eating a cheeseburger, but I haven't seen Jimmy Buffett around anywhere. That's probably because I'm not in a Caribbean paradise. I'm in Paradise, Michigan, on the shores of Whitefish Bay. Whitefish Bay sculpts the coast of Michigan's Upper Peninsula at the eastern end of Lake Superior, the world's largest body of fresh water. And the waters of Lake Superior around Whitefish Point exemplify what's drawing more and more divers into the Great Lakes that surround the state of Michigan, a fascinating assortment of startlingly well-preserved wrecks. Wrecks that trace the heritage and history of well over a century of commerce and seamanship on America's inland waterways. For the Great Lakes have exacted a heavy toll on ships and sailors. Frequent and unpredictable storms and fog, an array of navigational hazards, and plain human error have led to the loss of an estimated 6,000 major ships in the Great Lakes during the 300 years since early European settlers began plying these often unforgiving waters. Many of these wrecks are located and are accessible to divers in Michigan's lake bottomlands. Michigan has more Great Lakes coastline than any other state in the Union, over 3,000 miles, and touches four of the five Great Lakes. I find Whitefish Point a good place to begin exploring the attractions of Michigan, above and below the water. The area offers North Country grandeur and beauty at its finest. Nearby Taquamemnon State Park provides access to stately forests and cascading waterfalls. This 48-foot drop in the Taquamemnon River flows at a rate of 50,000 gallons per second. Visitors to Whitefish can find comfortable and attractive lakefront accommodations like Curley's Motel in the town of Paradise. Whitefish Point is also the site of the Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum. Built around the Whitefish Point Lighthouse, this nonprofit project includes a video theater and a professionally displayed and interpreted collection of shipwreck artifacts and articles of the region's maritime history. 
from the equipment used by early salvage divers to a model of the well-known Edmund Fitzgerald, a 729-foot ore carrier that sank in 556 feet of water some 17 miles off Whitefish Point on November 10, 1975, Lake Superior's last major shipwreck. The museum provides an excellent opportunity to become familiar with the equipment and the features found on the various types of ships that have sunk in the area. For example, we're able to study a model of the steamer of Vienna before we dive on the wreck. Shipping traffic that traverses Lake Superior must pass around Whitefish Point, where Superior's first lighthouse was built in 1849. The lake narrows and westerly storms can pile up enormous waves here, so there have been a lot of wrecks in the area. Unfortunately, though, there aren't yet any established dive operators for whitefish, so access for visiting divers can be haphazard. We're lucky to meet an accommodating sea fan, Charlie Tulip, who's brought his boat up for some weekend diving with a group of family and friends. Charlie shows me the multiple tank rig and full face mask that he uses for wreck diving here, and we set off for a dive on the wreck of the Vienna. Quayle and Martin in Cleveland, Ohio built the Vienna, a 191-foot wooden steamer in 1873 to carry iron ore in the upper Great Lakes. On a clear, storm-free September 16, 1892, the Vienna was eastbound around Whitefish Point, passing the westbound steamer Nipigon. Without warning or apparent reason, the Nipigon turned and rammed the Vienna on her port side. The Nipigon saved the crew, but the Vienna sank in 140 feet of water, less than a mile offshore. Today, almost 100 years later, the ship still rests there, virtually intact. A lifeboat remains lashed to the deck near the stump of a broken mast. The steam boiler assembly stands exposed. From the engine, large pipes extend onto the deck, where broken beams reveal some of the construction methods of the period. A recent storm has reduced visibility, and the depth limits our bottom time to only a few minutes. But for me, the Vienna's a tantalizing introduction to Great Lakes wreck diving. However, Upper Peninsula divers in need of air fills or dive charter boats need to look west to the Munising Alger Underwater Preserve or east to St. Ignace and the preserve covering the Straits of Mackinac. Here, where Lake Michigan meets Lake Huron, tricky currents and lack of maneuvering room give rise to lots more Michigan wrecks to explore. Our host and guide for our tour of the North Country is the owner and manager of wreck diving systems in Detroit, Mike Cohut. Mike arranges dive trips around the region and knows the attractions well. On our way to the Mackinac Straits, we stop in Sault Ste. Marie, site of the world's busiest waterway lock system. Here, visitors can tour the SS Valley Camp, a modern Great Lakes freighter that's been converted into a museum. Strolling the decks allows us to leisurely study the layout and construction of a monstrous ship like this before diving on one. Cruise quarters, bridge, and engine room all provide glimpses into the workings of these maritime stalwarts. The orientation helps on our first dive in the Straits. The Cedarville, which sank after a collision in 1965, was an ore carrier similar to the Valley Camp we've just toured. Despite encountering strong currents and unusually poor visibility, we're able to recognize some familiar equipment and cabin structure. Before our next day's diving on the Brig Sandusky, a sailing vessel which sank in Lake Michigan way back in 1856, I have a chance to talk with Mike about Great Lakes diving. Mike, when did you get started with uh, dive operations here in Michigan? It started in 1970 when I moved up uh, to Michigan and started into diving in the local lakes, started diving in some of the Great Lakes, got involved in instruction, and 75 started into the retail business. Is there any, um, really special equipment or training that's necessary for a diver who's been mostly used to diving in the in the Caribbean or in warm water to be able to come up here and uh, enjoy the the shipwrecks of the Great Lakes? You can come up, get on one of the shallower wrecks, try out uh, if it's a new wetsuit or a new dry suit, try that out, get his buoyancy and such set up before he ventures down into the deeper wrecks. How is it that the wrecks here uh, have been so well preserved and uh, have lasted so long underwater? The water's cool, it preserves it, it's fresh water, we don't have any wood worms to eat the wood, the uh, metal parts stay intact, they don't rust uh, to any great degree, and they're 
preserved more or less naturally. And we've had a change in the past 10 years in the attitude of the majority of the divers, that they would prefer to go down, they'd prefer to look uh, at the shipwrecks, um, and leave them intact. The advent of underwater photography, the uh, simplification of a lot of the equipment, I think has added to that. Instead of people going down on the wrecks now, the divers, and thinking they have to bring back some memento, they can go down and take pictures. Mike, do you have any particular favorites that we'll be diving? Probably one of my favorites would be the uh, Brig Sandusky, sunk in the 1850s. It's one of the oldest wrecks, uh, known shipwrecks, in the uh, Straits area. We'll uh, tie up to the mooring, go down, and the mooring is attached to a centerboard winch just aft of midships. And if we'd move from that centerboard winch over to the rail on the port side and swim down there, we'll swim over intact decking. We'll be able to look down in some of the different hatches and holds uh, that are along there. We'll come up to a chain plate that had uh, dead eyes, still has dead eyes still attached to it, what they used to rig the, uh, the tension on the mast, the mast stays. If we move over from there, we'll actually be able to see the mast step where the mast was in place, broke off. Uh, just ahead of that is the mast itself still laying on the decks off to the side. We can move down that mast, swim back up. There's the rigging off the mast. There's a big uh, heart, uh, Lock heart still on there. So we move towards from the bottom towards the bow. We'll come onto the bow stem, come up, be able to see the chains leading out to the bow sprit. You can swim out that bow sprit probably about 25 feet. And it's, it's a unique bow sprit that was hinged so that they could fold it back to get it through the canal. Swim back into the bow sprit. As you come in, you'll see a, uh, another large anchor attached to the cat head sticking out off the side of the bow. Across from that, as we move in towards the deck, there's a large windlass that they used to lift and uh, lower those anchors with, um, still in place. Mechanism's in very, very good shape. On the starboard side, you'll find that the uh, planking on the deck is broke off. It'll give us an opportunity to drop down inside the wreck and swim through the holds. Now, the holds are empty. Uh, I was carrying uh, grain when it went down, so it's, there's nothing left in there. But we can swim down through it, take a look back up at the deck, see some of the ship's construction from the interior. Back in there, you'll be able to see the, uh, sh the stove that they use for heating and cooking back in the deck uh, quarters. Should be some fish inside the wreck. We find a lot of the burbot, a freshwater cod, uh, hanging around inside there. You come up to the out of the uh, quarters, and what you'll find is a ship's wheel and barrel mechanism that's quite unique. It's one of the first wheels that were ever put on the uh, Great Lakes ships. It has a large tiller in back of it and it was just a pulley system. They would turn the, uh, wind the rope around the drum, it would pull on one side or the other and the rope would run to either the side pulleys and the two side pulleys are there too. The rope of course is gone. We'll uh, pull up from there into another uh, area that has the pumps that were used to uh, bilge pumps, hand pumps to be used to pump out the uh, water out of the holds with. Just ahead of there, we'll be back to the uh, deck winch and can come up. For our Mackinac diving, Mike has introduced us to the Strait Scuba Center on the harbor in St. Ignace and its captain, Jim Ryersey. Captain Jim, a veteran mariner and diver in the area, takes us out on the comfortable Straits diver to the wreck of the Barnum in Lake Huron. Jim's grandfather conducted the first dive salvage operations on this wooden steamship after it was cut by ice and sank back in 1894. The Barnum is similar in structure to the Vienna, but it's only about 60 feet to the bottom, so we have time for a more leisurely exploration. The cargo of grain that filled the Barnum's hold was salvaged after she sank. Many parts of the ship's mechanical systems stand out in dramatic silhouettes. The Straits area abounds in attractions and facilities for visitors. We're staying at Detman's Resort, situated on the lakefront outside St. Ignace, with modern motel-style rooms and guest amenities. Before 1957, when one of the world's longest suspension bridges was built across the five-mile-wide Straits, Michigan's Upper Peninsula was quite isolated, linked primarily by ferry with the rest of the state to the south. 
Ferry boats still bustle around the harbors here, but today their main task is carrying visitors to historic Mackinac Island. Mackinac is a storybook setting that conveys a charming sense of the region's 18th and 19th century history. After the British gained control of the Straits from the French, they built Fort Mackinac in 1780. The United States took over in 1796, but the British recaptured the fort in 1812 and returned it in 1815. Later, the island became headquarters for John Jacob Astor's American Fur Company. During the late 1800s, stately cottages and the world-renowned Grand Hotel, with its expansive porch, were built here and the island became a summer retreat for the wealthy and the summer home of Michigan's governors. Much of the island's ambiance has been preserved by a ban on automobiles. Visitors and residents alike move about in horse-drawn carriages or on bicycles or horseback. Although Mackinac today does have a busy marina and a main thoroughfare crowded with the obligatory souvenir stores, boutiques, and fudge shops, we can still enjoy quiet spots for meals or relaxing, graceful parks and the charm of a carriage ride through history. About 100 miles south of Mackinac is another Michigan wreck diving center, Alpena, on the shores of Thunder Bay. Ships traveling between Chicago and Detroit cut a corner here at North Point. Many have cut it too close, earning Thunder Bay the sobriquet of Lake Huron's wreck alley. Divers can get to many of these wrecks with the services of Thunder Bay divers, located at a quiet marina just outside Alpena. Owners Ruth Ann and Bill Beck can accommodate large or small groups on their roomy, well-laid-out boat. Alpena is a quiet town with tranquil parks and an expansive shoreline. The Tower Motel here welcomes divers with fine accommodations. We've been joined on our Michigan tour by Joyce Hayward, a school teacher from Toledo, Ohio. Joyce has developed her passion for diving and for shipwrecks into much more than just a hobby, and is now a contributing editor of the Seafarer's Journal of Maritime Heritage. Joyce, how'd you get started uh, diving and exploring the shipwrecks of the Great Lakes? Well, when I first got interested in diving and realized that I had the resource of the shipwrecks right in my own backyard, I decided to take a course in shipwreck diving and take a look at what there was to offer, and I was just fascinated by what I had to see there. What I've been doing is uh, working with the historical and archaeological community and the sport divers and uh, creating workshops so that the sport divers could learn the fundamentals of nautical archaeology from the professionals. Then the sport divers can go out and begin working on projects, taking measurements and documenting, using photography and putting together what they are seeing. And then uh, that's benefiting not only the sport diver but the, uh, the whole community at large. Did you have any special difficulties or any, was there anything special that you had to do to get started diving here? No, I think uh, one of the best places for people who are novices to shipwreck diving to begin would be the preserves. The uh, charter services are very uh, knowledgeable about the wrecks that the divers will be on. They're very well buoyed so that the divers have a downline that uh, you know exactly where it's taking you rather than grappling in with uh, anchor and so forth. Tell me a little bit about uh, some of the wrecks that will be seen here in the Thunder Bay area. Well, a very popular wreck is the Grecian. She ran aground in a very dense fog in 1906, and as she was being pulled off, uh, she was lost while being pulled by a barge. Uh, you'll get to see a, a lot of very interesting wreckage because she's pretty much intact, uh, capstan, uh, windless, and uh, oh, a lot of uh, loose artifacts. And uh, because the ship uh, offers quite a bit of ship's integrity, you can penetrate the different levels, and the propeller is intact and I think you'll really enjoy that particular wreck. The wrecks of the Great Lakes constitute a priceless historical and recreational resource. John Peterson is a district extension agent with the Sea Grant program here in Michigan. John, the state of Michigan has been uh, one of the pioneers in the development of legislation to uh, preserve and protect its bottom land resources. Tell me a little bit about uh, how that came about. Uh, actually, in the early 70s, uh, a number of interests, including sport divers, business people, uh, marine historians, uh, saw the shipwreck resources in, in Michigan waters of the Great Lakes as a potential tourism resource and is certainly uh, an important historical resource for the history of Michigan, particularly through some efforts at Michigan State University, some researchers there and also some research uh, conducted by our Department of Natural Resources began to think about the concept of underwater parks here in the state of Michigan. Uh, it then became an evolution of those groups working together, uh, eventually resulting in the passage of some legislation in 1980 
that set up some special uh, salvage rights with shipwreck resources and also empowered the state to designate underwater preserves. The requirements apply to the artifacts and then it, it places controls over uh, the removal of those artifacts. Whether it's driving along forested roads where wildlife still roams, enjoying the spray of a sparkling waterfall, contemplating a wild stretch of shore, sampling historic Mackinac, or touching history underwater, Michigan offers divers something special. With water temperatures ranging from the 40s to the 60s and visibility rarely exceeding 50 feet and sometimes limited to 10 or 20, this certainly isn't the Caribbean. But for me, the sense of awe derived from gliding along the decks or exploring the interior of a wooden sailing ship that has remained intact underwater for well over 100 years is a thrilling and unique experience. It's what makes Michigan and its Great Lakes wrecks proof that a diving paradise doesn't have to be tropical. Is there a place we can go in Micronesia where it doesn't rain a lot, you've asked? Well, the answer is yes. They call it the Micronesian Sun Belt. We call it Equatorial Pacific Adventure Diving. Dive into history with World War II wrecks and mysterious grottos. Micronesian Sun and Adventure starts in Guam and continues to the little-known area of Micronesia called the Northern Marianas. Guam. The name immediately evokes pictures of a major World War II conflict. Marine tanks are used to spearhead the drive. Flame-throwing tanks move up to close range to burn out a Jap cave position from which the enemy has inflicted heavy casualties among our troops. August 10, 1944. American troops have just landed at Agat and Asan beaches on Guam. Outnumbered and outgunned, the Japanese must surrender. 2,000 American lives lost, 17,000 Japanese dead. Today, the memories of that bloody battle have faded, but will never be entirely forgotten. Knowing that the islands of Guam and the Northern Marianas were once a battleground during World War II, I dream of diving ghostly sunken warships and the twisted remnants of fighter airplanes. Of course, all are engulfed in warm waters surrounding lush tropical islands. Happily, my dreams and reality become as one, for Micronesia's Sun Belt possesses all that I envision and more. Guam. The island name comes from the Chamorro word Guahan, meaning we have. And modern day Guam does have everything visitors could possibly desire. First class hotels and dining, charming Spanish history, duty free shopping, crystal blue Pacific waters, and for the romantic, secluded white sand beaches. Our journey to Guam, America's westernmost possession in the Pacific, begins stateside with a flight to Honolulu, Hawaii. From Honolulu, we then head straight for Guam. Sprinkled north of Guam are the tips of an underwater mountain range rising up five miles from the Marianas Trench. This is the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands, a group of 14 islands, including Saipan, Rhoda, and Tinian. Shaped like a huge footprint, Guam was created from the formation of two volcanoes, offering visitors a taste of two different islands packaged into one. On the north part of the island, Guam is a high limestone plateau with steep high cliffs overlooking a frothy sea. To the south, mountains and a volcanic terrain exist with tumbling waterfalls and uninhabited dense jungles. In the blue Pacific waters which surround the island, the intricate coral reef supports every type of marine life imaginable brightly colored tropical fish freckle the coral kingdom. This is home to one of the most diverse fish populations in the world with hundreds of identified fish species. Plate-like corals form mazes of large layered parasols. Expansive beds of staghorn corals sprout in a mesh of dense thickets. 
This school of tangs finds something tasty to eat here before moving on to their next meal in the coral crannies. A bulbous anemone bed blankets the coral, providing a living home for a dozen or more clownfish, or anemone fish as they're also called. It's always fun to watch these feisty fellas as they dart in and out of the anemone's flowing tentacles. They remind me of a small, aggressive dog. At the first hint of danger, all bark and no bite. Fringing the waters around Guam's Tuman Bay, there are numerous plush high-rise hotels. The Guam Hilton has large air-conditioned rooms, a tropical poolside cocktail lounge with a lovely view of the bay, and a pretty beach, just perfect for swimming and beachcombing. A few miles north of the Hilton is the Pacific Star, a ritzy resort complex catering to every need and desire of guests. We enjoy swimming, tennis, even an indoor weight room equipped to help keep a body in perfect shape. Guam is an extremely unique and diverse island, a result of many outside influences from different peoples and cultures. In early history, tracing back to around 3000 BC, the island was inhabited by an ancient people from the Malay Peninsula. Today, intriguing latte stones are displayed in Latte Stone Park in Agania, the island's capital. These mysterious-looking stone pedestals and coral caps once supported the woven housings of the elite or upper class in early societies. Exploring the island, we find Jacques Cousteau's famous ship, the Alcyon, docked at Opera Harbor on Guam. It appears that Guam attracts not only pleasure divers, but the world-famous ones as well. To assist with our diving, we chose the Micronesian Divers Association, equipped with three scuba shops able to take complete care of our diving needs. Our first dive site is only a short five-minute boat ride from shore. Opera Harbor is a temporary base for a variety of shipping vessels and a permanent home for quite a few others. Eerily, the holes of the Tokai Maru and the Cormoran loom up from the bottom of this murky harbor. Here, they've found an unlikely meeting place. These warship wrecks possess a special fascination for divers, for this is one of the few diving spots in the world where we can visit two separate shipwrecks sunk 26 years apart on the same dive. The Cormoran is a German World War I auxiliary cruiser, and the Tokai Maru is a World War II Japanese freighter. Another popular dive site on Guam for advanced divers is the Blue Hole. As we descend towards the gaping mouth of the crevice, the water here is so clear that even our dive boat is visible 120 feet above us. The walls gleam a bright orange hue under our lights. Here a small school of squirrelfish hide out in the deep creases of the wall. The hole is an opening in the reef that starts at 60 feet and plummets down to 140 feet where a colorful archway leads to deep Pacific waters. At 125 feet, I enjoy the sensation of moving in a suspended state of weightlessness. Although the diving on Guam generally doesn't match the fantastic diving in Micronesia's Truck Lagoon or Palau, it is a good place to stop over for a few days, to break up the long trip to Micronesia, to practice your diving skills, or to become familiar with Pacific marine species. The Guamanians of today are descendants of Micronesians who intermarried with European, Oriental, and American settlers. These students are preparing for tomorrow week. Here, students work together building chamorro huts out of palm fronds and bamboo stalks, just as their ancestors did hundreds of years before them. Agania is the oldest European city in the Pacific. Located in the very heart of this bustling city, behind a facade of intriguing walls and wrought iron gates, we find the old Plaza de España. During Spanish colonial times, this was the center for political and religious activity. Guam's colonial past manages to retain its rightful place here as it clusters defiantly within the modern high-rises of today's Guam. 
The bay at Umatak once provided a safe harbor where Spanish galleons anchored. Forts like San Jose and Fort Soledad were built on the surrounding cliffs to protect the area from English pirates. A further tour of the island brings us to Inarahan Pool. This large, naturally formed saltwater swimming hole is a popular swimming and floating spot for Guamanians and visitors alike. For me, the true beauty of Guam is in its lush and often colorful landscape. After becoming temporary ingredients in Guam's vivid melting pot of color and culture, we head north to further explore Micronesia's sunbelt. With only a short plane ride on Continental, we arrive at our first stop, exotic Saipan. Temperatures here range in the 70s and 80s year-round, making this island a natural water playground. Windsurfing, sailing, jet skiing, and of course our favorite, scuba diving. The first dive day, we hook up with Ben Conception of Water Sports Incorporated and are transported by van to Saipan's Blue Grotto. But the relaxing ride over doesn't quite prepare me for what lay ahead. I was told that half of the fun of diving the Blue Grotto is getting to it. For this dive, our scuba gear is donned a long way from the water. Finally suited up, we begin our descent to the pool. About 20 minutes later, and 100 steep steps down, we see a glorious sunken water hole opening out the open ocean through two underground cave-like openings. The water looks great, but we're not there yet. Sharp rocks and surgy water makes reaching the pool a real accomplishment. We made it. As I slip below the surface, I realize it was worth every step. At 60 feet, the vast openness fills me with an eerie feeling of diving in a large room or chamber. A closer look unveils colorful and abundant marine life. Orange sea fans gracefully blossom from the cave walls. Striped Moorish idols circle each other along the rocky bottom. Off in the distance, the shimmering blue light of open ocean beckons me forward to explore what lies beyond. Leaving the protected walls of the grotto, I feel small and downright insignificant in the vastness of planet ocean. I welcome the company of so many colorful tropical fish. Above water, Saipan has many western-style hotels to choose from. The Hyatt Regency Saipan and the Hafaday Beach Hotel offer everything we desire. Air-conditioned rooms, pleasant surroundings, and all the needed amenities. The friendly Saipanese are mostly Chamorro and Carolinians, a proud race whose culture and language enhances the island's flavor. The Spanish influence here is reflected in Chamorro family names and customs. The Spanish heritage is now also being found underwater as artifacts from the Manila galleon Nuestra Señora de la Concepcion, which sank off Saipan during a typhoon some 300 years ago, are discovered by salvage divers and archaeologists from Pacific Sea Resources. In 1944, Saipan was a fierce battleground for the occupying Japanese and American forces advancing across the Pacific. Retreating Japanese troops used Banadero Cave here as the last command post for the defense of the island. Nearby are the Banzai Cliffs where thousands of Japanese soldiers and civilians jumped to their deaths to avoid surrender. Relics of the war on Saipan are found not only above the water, but underwater as well. This old World War II seaplane didn't fly far from shore before it exploded and crashed. It now lies scattered in pieces across the sandy bottom, providing shelter for a variety of sea life. Three miles away from Saipan lies Tinian. Ironically, 
This tiny island ushered in a new era in man's history. From here on August 6, 1945, the Enola Gay, an American B-29 bomber, set off on a bombing mission to Hiroshima, Japan, to drop the first atomic bomb. During the war, the largest airfield in the world was built here, with four expansive runways, where thousands of combat missions were launched towards Japan. Today, these desolate strips of concrete stretch unused, overgrown by jungle. Beneath the water surrounding Tinian, we find a colorful, delicate garden, one made of beautiful, living coral. Here we come across two white-tipped sharks resting under a rock ledge. They act more perturbed by our presence than anything else. This one comes out to survey our unwelcome intrusion. Now the second shark stirs. This one's clipped tail tells me that this shark had a close encounter of the wrong kind. Our final Marianas destination is Rhoda. Only a small population lives here in the main village named Song Song. The surrounding landscape possesses a rustic beauty all its own. On the outskirts of Song Song village, we enter the cool darkness inside Tonga Cave. Early inhabitants of Rota held meetings and ceremonies here. If you're ready for a quiet getaway, then Rota is for you. Pristine, palm-lined beaches are a great place to relax and play. Guam. Saipan, Rhoda, and Tinian. Our Micronesian fantasy is complete. I'm Lynn Isaacair. For all of us at SeaFans, thank you for being with us. I'm Jimmy Ibbotson. Have a nice dive. And remember, keep breathing. Fans, subscriptions, and back issues are available at dive stores everywhere or call 1 800 622 8767 to order. Also, look for Set Sail, the video magazine for sailing enthusiasts, at marinas and boating supply stores. Sea Fans and Set Sail are productions of Passage Home Communications Incorporated. <laughs>